Hello, I'm Andrew Fanning, and this is an introduction to the Data Portrait of Place Handbook, a tool that provides guidance on how to select targets and indicators for your place, and to monitor what it would mean to live in the donut from a data-led perspective. And the starting point is to unroll the donut so that we have some space between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling to explore what it would mean for your place to achieve local aspirations here, to be thriving people in a thriving place, and to respect global responsibilities to safeguard the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet. Now, my colleague Kate Rayworth has made a separate video that introduces the four questions at the core of this Donut Unrolled methodology and how they can be answered in different ways, layering on different perspectives that can collectively offer a rich and holistic portrait of your place. So if you haven't watched Kate's 10-minute Donut Unrolled introductory video, I really recommend that you do that now before listening to anything else that I have to say. <laughs> okay, now that we're all on the same page, I'm going to zoom in on the data layer focused on selecting locally relevant targets and indicators to measure social and ecological performance. And the core methodology for selecting targets and indicators across these four lenses is set out in the Donut Unrolled Data Portrait of Place Handbook. And the current version is a 40-odd page document available on Google Docs or as a PDF, which is published on the Donut Economics Action Lab platform. And it zooms into each of the core questions of Donut Unrolled, offering step-by-step -step guidance based on experiences in real-world places, especially cities such as Amsterdam and Brussels, together with examples and insights and other resources. And we've done our best to make it as concise and informative as possible, but it's a work in progress, and we're learning what's useful as we collaborate with many changemakers worldwide, and we of course invite all of your contributions and adaptations so that we can continue to make it better. It's worth highlighting the principles guiding what the data portrait has and has not been designed to measure so that you can assess whether it fits your needs or not, or if it needs some adapting to, to fit them. So be locally relevant rather than comparable between places. This is core. There are many initiatives that aim to create comparisons between places, and these can be very useful to understand a given place's performance in a wider context and relative to others. But what's lost often in such comparisons is the rich local specificity of a place and the relevance of its historical and cultural context, all of which can be crucial entry points for transformative action. Take the long view. So we don't have all the methods and data needed to create metrics that are fit for 21st century goals and realities. But in a decade or so, our hope is that we'll look back at this video and at this early methodology and see it as crude. And it is, but we'll only make progress if we start where we are and keep pushing ourselves to improve. And compare desired outcomes versus current performance. So again, many initiatives measure performance with respect to others, or with respect to our past selves. And this is important, but it is at least as important to measure performance with respect to where we want to be. And this is a core aspect of donut metrics. Offer a holistic snapshot for discussing complex issues. So rather than provide a comprehensive assessment, the data portrait has been designed to prioritize the whole and to provide an overview perspective that invites holistic reflection on the complex interconnections that emerge across the four lenses. So often only a fraction of the possible data can be shown. Create an opportunity for tracking progress. If time consistent data are available or they can be created, the data and information within the four lenses of the portrait could be tracked and updated over time, and this is an aspiration for many places already. Combine data with community perspectives, the data portrait will be richly enhanced by bringing together with the data people's sense of their place through stories, lived experience, and other sources of community information. And we think that these layers could be combined simultaneously, or one before and another one after, or whatever makes the most sense in your place, depending on your context and the time and the resources and expertise available. Now the philosopher Carveth Reed once said, it is better to be vaguely right than precisely wrong. And these are some very wise words that to me underscore differences in quantitative and qualitative data. 
If we can identify quantitative targets and indicators that are expressed in the same units, they can be compared numerically to give a ratio of shortfall or overshoot, which can be visualized in a chart or as a red wedge in the donut, and that can be powerful. But that's often what most people think of as data. But actually, the process of finding comparable targets and indicators in numerical terms is really quite strict, and it can force analysts to on the one hand used inadequate data because those are the only numbers that are available and on the other hand it can also lead to excluding a lot of potentially relevant data that may not be numerically comparable but that you can put side by side to see that they're clearly talking about the same thing and could be used for qualitative assessment. So the data portrait welcomes both quantitative and qualitative sources of data. Now let's jump into the four lenses canvas. Well, from a data-led perspective, we're aiming to collect information that answers two core questions. What's our locally relevant target or commitment? And how are we doing? And for targets, we don't just accept anything uncritically. We must also always ask, is it sufficiently ambitious? And for indicators, often there may be some semi-relevant data that is available. But again, ask if this is actually the data that we need. So in an ideal world, the process of creating a data portrait goes along by diving into each of these dimensions and identifying locally relevant targets and indicators across all of the ecological dimensions, both locally and globally, and likewise across all of the social dimensions, once again, both locally and globally. And of course, in this process, one could imagine making meaningful connections by getting in touch with all kinds of local experts and knowledge holders and gaining fascinating insights and learnings along the way. Of course, in practice, nothing works out completely ideally, so you could end up with a first data pass that looks a little something like this. There are often lots of targets and indicators available that address the dimensions of the local social lens, even if they're not completely numerically comparable. And this is especially the case in wealthy cities and regions. In the local ecological lens, there may be some relevant indicators, especially focused on so-called ecosystem services, but it is still too rare to find ecological targets based on the aspiration to match or exceed nature's generosity. And in the global ecological lens, there tends to be some locally relevant indicators that could be defined with respect to a few planetary boundaries, especially for climate change, but by no means all of them. And the global social lens often has the least data of the four, largely because responsibility for the well-being of people outside of a given place has historically been designed to likewise be outside its jurisdiction, especially when it's in a different country. So there's still a lot of work remaining to create the metrics we need to measure progress in the 21st century. And a final point here is if there are no available data, we recommend that researchers and analysts don't remove any dimensions from the portrait, just color it gray or something. We strongly believe that if you make an important issue invisible, then it's much less likely to be addressed. And of course, this point applies far beyond just data. Now let's use the rest of our time to zoom into each of these four lenses, briefly covering some analysis questions and approaches that are discussed in the Data Portrait Handbook. So where do we start if you want to define and measure the local aspiration of thriving for all the people in your place? Well, of course, that's going to depend on where you are in the world and what thriving means. But here are some entry point questions to keep in mind. Critically, who decides what thriving means? Like, how do we ensure that all voices are heard? And which of the 16 local social dimensions that we have identified should be focused on? what targets should we set and what legitimacy would they therefore hold and what data could we gather from available sources or create ourselves and with others to show current status now this table is in the data portrait for your further reference but in amsterdam it shows that the approach was a qualitative mapping of some of the the many relevant aspirational statements and goals contained in official city strategic policy documents and then they compared these targets with illustrative statistics from published sources. So where do we start on the local aspiration to be as generous as nearby nature? So we would start with where on this planet is your place? What biome, what ecosystem and habitat is your place embedded within? 
and how could we learn from and consciously emulate life's genius at creating conditions conducive to life where we are? How do we define and aim to match or exceed nature's generosity here? What does generosity of nature even mean here? We need to understand what kinds of data could we gather and how. And how could we best make visible the ways that thriving natural spaces enhance human well-being? Now, ideally, a biomimicry specialist would recommend to go to the wildland next door, select the core ecosystem functions after observing it for a while, and start measuring how many tons of carbon are stored, or the number of species in a given area, or the liters of groundwater retained. And these ecological performance standards would become the benchmark to assess the same functions of a place compared to nature's generosity. Now, due to a lack of time and resources, the team in Amsterdam took a desk-based approach of mapping how nature performs on each dimension based on published sources, alongside the closest official city targets available and illustrative statistics of performance. Now, this approach doesn't match up to biomimicry standards in practice, but it still provided a valuable input for officials and change makers to start to see what they were doing and to discuss possible design strategies that could take their city closer to matching the performance of the wider ecosystem in which it is embedded. Now, what about the global ecological lens that measures the impacts of our place on the nine planetary boundaries? So which boundaries could we focus on? How could we define our place's fair share of a global resource and emissions budget? How do our lifestyles here create ecological burdens and pressures beyond the political border? And where can we leverage the most strategic power to act? So let's take a look at the quantitative approach used in Global North cities to downscale planetary boundaries in this lens. And it starts with the dimensions that are informed by the planetary boundaries framework. So based on these dimensions, analysts can gather global boundary data. But then we come to a huge ethical problem, which is how to define the city's fair share of the boundary. And of course, there's no right answer to this question. Like from a technical perspective, it could range across a spectrum from perfect equality across all people and over all time to perfect inequality where one evil dictator gets everything today. But in practice, there are a range of well-known sharing principles based on equality or on sovereignty or on responsibility and so on. And in Amsterdam, they adopted an equal per capita approach based on consumption right now to define their city boundary. And that sharing principle is arguably better and more just than other approaches, but it's still hugely beneficial to a global north city because it doesn't take into account historical responsibility for past emissions and resource use. So once you have defined a city boundary and the sharing principle upon which it is based, the next step is to gather consumption-based environmental footprint data to measure the ecological burdens of consuming goods and services in our place, no matter where in the world those burdens occur through a product's entire life cycle. And such data is now widely available at the national level, thanks to major advances in the past 10 years or so. But it now leads to a similar problem as the boundary. How do we define the city share of a national footprint? Now, Amsterdam adopted an income-adjusted approach based on the observation that wealthier people tend to have a larger resource and carbon footprint than poorer people. But better than this income-adjusted approach, it would be much better to have rigorous subnational footprint estimates. And these are now emerging as well, including in Amsterdam. So the final step in this illustrative flow is to divide the city footprint by the city boundary. And with that, you can get a measure of city overshoot. And here's what the quantitative results looked like alongside a qualitative mapping of official city targets and additional notes in Amsterdam from the data portrait. And you can also find a supplementary spreadsheet with the calculations in the same tool. So where do we start on how to measure the global responsibility to respect the well-being of all people? And there are so many ways that we are connected, both positively and negatively. So how could we recognize these two way relations is the question. How do we set targets and what kinds of data could we gather? And what would be most strategic to focus on? We include this table throughout the Donut Unrolled tools because it provides a useful entry point to envisioning some of the many ways that households, organizations, and public institutions engage in systems that can affect people worldwide as workers, communities, migrants, and entire nations. 
And a sample of the major ways that people are connected through global systems are through global supply chains, through the climate and ecological impacts of lifestyle patterns by some on others, through cultural connections, through policies on immigration and asylum seekers, and broader international policy regimes with an uneven playing field that's tilted towards the most advantaged and often enforced by international institutions. In Amsterdam, the targets chosen were based on the Sustainable Development Goals, which were then mapped qualitatively to illustrate how the lives of precarious workers in food, textiles, and electronic sectors are affected by and through global supply chains that link dangerous and exploitative working conditions to the sale of products by major brands in the city. Now let's zoom back out again and recall a major point of gathering all these targets and indicators is for them to be shared with others as a whole and as an input to locally relevant discussion. So if the aim is to be locally relevant, then we can expect each data portrait to have a different look and feel. And that diversity to us is something to celebrate. But there's an open question of how to make the broad range of results visible and compelling while respecting the integrity of the four lenses. And that's not a small task. And we also know the power of precedent and peer-to-peer -peer inspiration, and we've been hugely motivated to see different places connecting and learning from one another as they sort through what works out best for them. Now here are just a few examples, and I know they're too small to do justice to the care that has gone into the work, but to give a sense of the possibilities. Now Amsterdam was the first city to publish a portrait, and their approach was to show the targets and indicators with rings for each lens and text boxes for the qualitative data. The Brussels Donut team built on Amsterdam's approach and they used drawings to help make the story of their portrait more fun and welcoming. Then the Leeds Donut Coalition and Civic Square in Ladywood, a neighborhood in Birmingham, they both made distinct and incredibly valuable contributions to visual storytelling with the data portrait, combining words and icons and drawings and bar charts all weaved together along a kind of pathway. And now, another big question that we're working on, together with the next generation of initiatives, is how to re-roll the donut. How do we reconcile the amount of information and the understandable desire for a place to see their donut, while still recognizing and making visible that core balance between local aspirations and global responsibilities? Of course, we know there won't be a single answer, and the image shown here is it's just a mock-up but we can't wait to see the next iterations in visualization and design, and we know that they'll inspire many others in turn. So there you have it, an introduction to selecting targets and indicators across the four lenses of the Donut Unrolled portrait. Thanks so much for listening, and do check out the other videos in this series for inspiring examples from communities and from cities who are using this data-led tool, adapted to their own context, together with other tools that have been created to put the concepts of Donut Economics into action.